We have an excellent panel. I'm uh, going to run this a little bit like a National Security Council meeting where we start thinking through options. I was senior director for Asia um, in the Bush administration and uh, left before the Thai problems broke <laughs> um, the last time they had a series of NSC meetings, but I can imagine what they were like. Um, joining me on the panel are Frank Januzzi, who is currently the president and CEO of the Mansfield Foundation. Before that, he was uh, the um, deputy executive director for Amnesty uh, in the US. Um, and uh, Vikram Singh. Um, Vikram is now at the Center for American Progress, where he's vice president for national security and international policy. And as many of you know, he was deputy assistant secretary of defense for South and Southeast Asia uh, until months ago. <clears throat> and of course, Ernie, Dato Ernie Bauer, our, um, our uh, leader of the uh, Southeast Asia programs uh, and the um, man behind our program today. Um, so I want to thank all of them for joining. We'll <clears throat> go through a series of questions uh, up here, and then I'll open it up um, for discussion. Uh, the earlier panel, panel talked uh, briefly about uh, why Thailand is important to the United States. I don't think we need to um, uh, reiterate those points <clears throat> or the long and close history we have with Thailand, our oldest treaty in Asia, um, allies fought side by side in um, numerous uh, conflicts over the years. Um, but it's a very complicated relationship, to say the least. Um, we've just done uh, polling at CSIS. We surveyed um, foreign policy experts in 11 countries uh, around the Pacific Rim about how they saw the future of order uh, and international relations in Asia. Um, we're going to be publishing this in about two weeks. But let me give you a few of the more uh, stunning uh, responses we got um, from Thailand, um, which indicates uh, how complicated our relationship has become. We surveyed 11 countries. Um, one of the questions we asked was, what country, what country will be the dominant power in Asia in 10 years? Um, the Thai respondents by far had the strongest belief that China would be the dominant power, even more than the Chinese. 89% of Thai respondents said China would be the dominant power. We asked whether US leadership in Asia is in the interests of your country. Um, Thailand had the lowest number saying that US leadership in Asia is in the interest of Thailand. Now, these are not government officials. These are think tankers, uh, intellectuals. But only 7% of Thai respondents said that continued US leadership was in their interests, which was well below China. Uh, we did not survey North Korea. Um, uh, but, uh, but it was well below China. It was quite stunning. And then we asked, do you support or oppose the US repivot to Asia? And Thailand was second only to China in expressing opposition to the US pivot or rebalance to Asia. Um, uh, to preview our results, the rest of the region was 90% favorable. It was very favorable. Um, but China was most concerned, not surprisingly. But Thailand was second only to China. So again, these are not government views, and they're not public views. These are um, think tankers, opinion shapers in Thailand. But uh, it, it, it indicates that as close as our relationship is, as close as particularly as our military relationship is, uh, as long as our history together is, um, there's some real disquieting undertones of suspicion um, and divergence about what the future of Asia means. And I just mentioned that as context uh, before we start. Now, to turn to our panelists, <clears throat> um, I'd like to present the first question so that we can advise the president uh, on how to think about this problem. Um, we heard earlier, as I said, about why Thailand is important to the United States. But could I ask each of you, we'll start with Frank and go down the line, um, why this particular chaotic situation is important, not just in terms of Thailand's importance, but in terms of our larger foreign policy interests in Asia, in democracy and good governance and rule of law, um, uh, in managing uh, uh, a rising China and so forth. Why do the developments matter? And if you want, you can you know, give the audience a uh, preview of how you think this might unfold in the coming weeks and months. Frank? Thank you, Michael. Um, well, I, I think I, I have to offer at least a, a sh very short disclaimer, which is that uh, what I learned about Thailand, I learned by accident uh, when I was sent there instead of China. Uh, I had been hoping to go to China. Tiananmen Square happened. Uh, I was not welcome to go to China uh, as far as the State Department was concerned. So they sent me to Thailand. 
And all the way over to Thailand, on my very first visit there in 1990, I was reading the Lonely Planet guidebook, uh, trying to learn something about Thailand and trying to learn a little Thai. Uh, and so when I arrived at the embassy, uh, I reported the next morning to Skip Boyce, who was the political counselor at the time. And uh, he said, hello, uh, who are you? I'm Frank Chinuzzi. I'm here from the State Department to help you. That's very nice. Um, how's your Thai? I said, put Thai may die. So it's okay. So then he starts jabbering at me in Thai. And then I had to interrupt him a couple minutes later. No, really, put Thai may die. I don't, do not speak Thai. And so he says, well, what, what the, mm, am I going to do with you? Um, and so he sent me to the Cambodia border, which was the beginning of my, uh, <laughs> beginning of my experience of Thailand. Um, and so, so I think of the Thai relationship in a special way ever since uh, that year in 1990. And um, not trying to dodge your question, Michael, but I would say that uh, it is important to understand that the Thai relationship is important in the United States, not just because of the bilateral relationship, but because of what Thai represents to US interests in mainland Southeast Asia. It is the hub uh, of so much of what the United States is attempting to accomplish in Southeast Asia. Uh, regional economic integration, uh, promotion of good governance and democratic values, uh, uh, receptivity to uh, refugees and, and uh, human rights, um, counterinsurgency in an effective way, uh, hopefully, in, in the South. And so the reason that the outcome matters is because as goes Thailand, so goes, in, in my mind, the model of, of democratic, tolerant, constitutional governance in Southeast Asia. It's going to have a huge impact on Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and neighboring Myanmar. So um, it is of vital importance for the United States that the crisis in Thailand be resolved in a way that ultimately reaffirms uh, those principles of good governance. Um, and the problem for the president is that reflective of the polling data that, that uh, Michael shared, reflective of the fact that the U.S. consulate in Songkhla no longer exists, that is now the Chinese consulate in Songkhla, the actual building that the United States had. I, I mean, it's, 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 to me, it's a stunning physical manifestation of the diminution of the U.S. influence in Thailand. Um, the fact that um, our uh, response to the 97 financial crisis was not what the Thai people and government would have liked, and, and uh, we lost uh, significant uh, credibility and confidence among the Thai people and government uh, at that time, which has never been fully restored. For all of these reasons, frankly, uh, Mr. National Security Advisor, our, our, our leverage is not what it should be, uh, but it's of vital importance that we not make the situation worse, um, and that we promote an outcome that ultimately reaffirms principles of democratic governance. And I think the best way to do that right now is probably to keep a low profile and to focus on the mill-to-mill -mill relationship at a low level, uh, to encourage the military to do what they've been doing, which is to remain aloof from trying to meddle directly uh, in the political outcomes. At least that's my understanding of their role up till this point. Um, and to look to the Thai, ultimately, I hate to sound uh, uh, like there's nothing to be done, but to ultimately look to the Thai to sort things out. Um, so that's, that's the best advice I have right now, is to remember that it matters, uh, that it matters to everything, to the Lower Mekong Initiative, to the future of Burma, uh, to whether or not the insurgency in the South becomes inflamed as a regional one or not, um, uh, but to keep a low profile. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mike. Mr. National Security Advisor. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Um, I, I agree with everything that, uh, that Frank said. And what one, one thing I think is important to distinguish. So on the one hand, Thailand is uniquely able to continue to function both on its own in the region and with the United States, despite a really unimaginable level of uh, chaos, uh, an unimaginable level of disruption, the kinds, of, the kinds of disruptions that would, in many ways, grind many countries to a halt seem to sort of just be, uh, you know, there's, a, there's some element of Teflon going on in Thai society and in the Thai business community. They, they will take the hits, but they will bounce back, and that's happened, that's happened time and time again. But this time, it feels like it might be different. 
and I think, uh, I think the, the nature of this really hyper-politicized zero-sum politics is going to take Thailand uh, to, a, a new, to a new place that none of us can actually define or predict, but it is almost certainly very damaging for Thailand in the medium to long term, and I think damaging to the region and to U.S. national security interests. I, it's, not that, it's not that Thailand faltering and having this, this political chaos will, um, you know, somehow profan profoundly damage the region. It seems that we will be able to maintain a lot of bilateral cooperation, a lot of re regional cooperation, uh, no matter who prevails in the internal political contests in Thailand. But if Thailand falters, I think it is, uh, it, it is going to be a powerful drag on the progress for Southeast Asia as a whole, not just mainland Southeast Asia, but actually the entire ASEAN region. I think that you see a concern now from ASEAN as a, as a group calling for dialogue to try to resolve uh, the, the political differences within, uh, within Thailand. Um, I think there is, there is growing concern, but the fact is that Thailand is an engine for Southeast Asia. And as Thailand goes, it's not that it will become, you know, it will drag the region down, but it will be a drag on the region. There is no doubt about that. Um, when it comes strictly to why the chaos matters for the United States, uh, again, on the one hand, it seems like we can manage through an awful lot of chaos. We successfully held Cobra Gold this year in the mill-to-mill -mill arena. We, uh, we still are able to uh, do a lot with Thailand, both in the region and beyond. The Thai military is a constructive partner in regional institutions. We have, uh, we have lots of flights transiting through. We do lots of training with them and with others. Um, so just in the mill-to-mill -mill sense, that all works. Economically, uh, I am sure that industries and businesses are already starting to think about their alternatives because this looks like it's a long-lasting political crisis. But Lots of, uh, lots of the private sector investment that's in Thailand is going to be there for the long term as long as something, you know, as long as things continue to limp along. I mean, it's not that, it, Thailand is well enough integrated that you can, that we can sort of, we can sort of get by. Um, were we to sort of lose that, I think it is very detrimental for the United States. And so, um, this brings up a lot of questions for what our leverage is and how we should use that leverage. Um, Thailand is not a place for us to use a lot of blunt tools. Thailand is a place of subtlety, and it's a place where us being uh, thoughtful in how we respond and how we talk to our Thai counterparts about what will or won't happen depending on how they manage things um, is going to be very important. So I think, um, much like Frank said, low profile keeping engagement up in, in many ways, but we're going to have to start thinking about where we might have triggers that, re that would require some sort of action. I think our recent management of the crisis has been relatively good. We have said you know, to the Thai military, you know, stay on the sidelines. The Thai military has stayed on the sidelines. I don't think it's because we've said that. I think it's because they truly would not like to get sucked into this uh, mess and don't see anything good coming out of something like a coup. But I think it's important that we give indicators uh, to Thai counterparts and to Thais on, on all sides of, of, the, of the crisis. I'm sure Ernie will talk more about where the crisis might go, but I think I, I find it a highly unpredictable uh, situation. And I find Thailand's capacity to manage this kind of thing strangely better than almost any other country. Maybe in the next round we can talk a little bit more about the China issues that Frank brought up, but I'll, I'll end there. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Senior Director, I, I love when Mike thinks up these scenarios where he's always like the security director, you know, or president or something like that. It, it works. I like it. Um, but, uh, Mr., uh, I guess it's uh, National Security Advisor. I think the numbers that you shared at the outset of the meeting reflect not what, where the ties genuinely hold uh, the United States right now. I, I detect that it's, it reflects more that the Thais are searching for their own identity. And, and I think they're not sure about answering these questions in that context. You know, the Thais have been extremely insular uh, over the last, uh, we, we could say since, uh, for the last five or six years. And I think um, we also have to be, uh, have a lot of humility about our role. 
I think we overstate the depth of our relationship. Well, it's very broad and very in, deeply engaged. Uh, I think we, we find ourselves, although this is our oldest treaty ally in Asia, at a, um, at a, at a point where our relationship with Thailand is, has become very tactical. Uh, it's not strategic. Uh, and that, and we're, what we're missing here is strategic depth. Those old relationships of the people like Colonel John Cole, who've been in the trenches uh, with the Thais uh, through wars and through training and through uh, different experiences, um, I think we need to uh, reboot uh, on, on that level of depth and, and, um, and the relationship are, are very, uh, that will be very important to climbing back, but we shouldn't rush. We need to be nuanced, as, uh, as Vikram suggested. Um, I think we need to be, uh, we have to have humility, as Frank suggested. Um, there's gonna be a question point here, and I think the ties are very much um, uh, quietly looking to Washington. I think there is leverage in Washington, uh, although they do see the embassy right now as having, um, and I think this is wrong, uh, but I do think that Thais uh, in Thailand have seen the embassy as being uh, painted red. Uh, and we need to have that in mind. So Washington is gonna have to deliver messages here. I think that um, our, our leverage uh, are several. Uh, one is we do have good relationships with the military. Uh, we do have good relationships with individual ties on all sides of this crisis. Uh, we do have incredibly good relationships with Thai business. Um, and I think um, all these points are important. Thailand matters to us uh, because we saw as in the floods um, a couple of years ago, when, when you take Thailand out of the global and regional supply chain, uh, everybody gets not just a, a cold, but they get a version of the flu. I mean, Thailand is a seminal uh, investment uh, destination for American business, and Vikram was right. We aren't pulling up stakes there. We are invested. We are with the ties through this, con this, through this conflict, so we have a long-term interest from a business point of view. Same is true militarily and from a security point of view. The ties have been tactically um, our best friends in terms of staging, uh, not only for military reasons um, and intel sharing, but also on HADR. Uh, we, when the crisis hit in Myanmar, um, we were flying, um, uh, or we were staging out of Utapau. Uh, we will continue to see that as a very important uh, way forward. I think regionally, in the regional context, I want to mention this too. Thailand is, is very important. Thailand is the place where in 1967 ASEAN was founded. It is one of the original five members of ASEAN. The, the Secretary of State, uh, our last Secretary of State, uh, Clinton, uh, called, I think rightly, ASEAN the fulcrum or the center of new emerging regional security and uh, economic architecture. To the extent Thailand is weak, ASEAN is weak. And that can be exploited by uh, people trying to weaken ASEAN for, uh, for tactical reasons or strategic reasons. And I think we've seen that from China recently on the South China Sea and the pressure they've put on various ASEAN chairs at the ASEAN summit and uh, ASEAN regional forum. So to execute our strategy of a strong ASEAN, we need to, uh, we need to work through this with the Thais. I agree with Vikram that we can't solve the problem for the Thais, but we can indicate, and I think we need to indicate at a higher level than we have done, that we need to be supportive. Most likely scenario, is there will be conflict. Um, the, the sides um, have, this is an existential 100 year uh, power struggle. Uh, the, what's important is who has power when the succession takes place and when his majesty passes uh, from the scene. And so um, no matter what uh, hopeful signs we're seeing, no matter which prime minister gets ousted in the near term, this struggle is not over until the succession takes place. We don't and should not expect resolution or stability in Thailand until that takes place. And when it takes place, uh, Thailand is going to need friends and we need to be there. Um, thank you. Let me um, uh, confirm for our friends watching online that this is not actually the National Security Council. I am no longer in government. Vikram is no longer in government. Um, and the questions I ask are not um, 
designed to illustrate a policy I would recommend. Um, I think I agree with all of you, but I, I do want to try to push yeah. in the way that um, a non-Asia or non-Thai expert looking at problems around the world would push to, un to understand, for example, how much risk we should take, how much we should compromise our principles in order to retain influence and so forth. So let me ask some questions along those lines. But uh, Ernie, you, you said, in effect, you think this will lead to conflict. And let me ask Vikram and, and Frank to respond to that and to answer the question, uh, Vikram, what, when you, you said if Thailand falters, what does Thailand falters look like? Is it armed conflict or is it more? And we'll do Vikram and then Frank. I I think um, I think Thailand faltering is uh, is essentially armed armed clashes, and I and I and I un unfortunately I think both sides have ensured that they have the means to go there should they need to. Um, so uh, they're they're. Uh, and of course, that would be the kind of scenario where you may see the military feeling like it's compelled to become involved in, uh, in in order to in order to preserve some sort of some sort of semblance of stability. So, when you ask what does it look like, it looks like, um, you know, uh, if not, you know, God forbid, civil war. But it looks like uh, it looks like something really ugly with violent clashes, with uh, with with blood in the streets. Um, now. Uh, Thailand and many other countries have gone through this kind of, uh, you know, painful, these kind of painful periods in the past. And I, and I, and I do think that at some point, um, there, you know, there has to be, there has to be a, a, a sane middle in Thailand that will, that will emerge. The hope is it emerges in time in a way that can diffuse conflict. The, the hope is that some sort of accommodations can happen that would diffuse that, that, that trajectory. But I, I believe that we're at a point now where, uh, where, the, where the, uh, the, the camps in Thailand are prepared and there are those on both sides that are sort of gearing up for, um, you know, putting their, putting their money where their mouth is in terms of being able to fight for their side, and that's uh, and and that would be something you can't it's you can't predict. It's a total hypothetical to try to figure out how exactly one would deal with that. But it is something we should be preparing to uh, to face um, should should it come to that. Well, I I hope you're wrong. I, I fear you may be right. Uh, I, I would say that Thailand to me is faltering now. Uh, it's faltering in that it's not able to play the leadership role within ASEAN that the United States hopes it will play. It's not able to address uh, the crisis of confidence in its major institutions inside Thailand, including confidence in the courts uh, right now. Um, and so there's an element of failure that is inherent to this moment of um, political uh, conflict. And that will only intensify if there's more bloodshed. My first visit to Thailand, I remember going to the movie theater and, and uh, for the first time seeing the, the movie and having the national anthem played as, as it is in the beginning of, of Thai movies and everyone standing up and, and paying uh, homage to the king. Um, there was a, a, a very seductive uh, security to the notion that there was this fatherly uh, figure uh, who would bind the nation together against all adversity. Um, and, uh, you know, we we're losing that sense of confidence if it's not lost completely. Um, and the future is, is uh, uh, fraught with uncertainties uh, surrounding succession. So I would say that um, you know, the, the bloodshed, I think, I would hope that it would be minimal. Um, and that the US role in this uh, uh, should be to, to look to uh, the forces of stability in Thailand that do exist. Uh, and de facto, that means the military. Um, um, but not to step in to, to govern the country, but to help ensure law and order. Um, and I think that what we see right now in Thailand is uh, uh, a very welcome uh, intention of the military to remain as um, reserved in their role as possible. But if the kind of bloodshed that Vikram is predicting breaks out, uh, then the first duty of the state is to protect its citizens from harm. Uh, and that's the same as it is in, in Myanmar today, you know, where the United States is attempting to advance civilian democratic governance. But when you see the kind of violence that you've seen in Rakhine State, 
um, there may be no alternative but to turn to the institutions that are capable of quelling that violence, you know, to restore order. Uh, the country cannot be governed uh, with Bangkok streets awash in blood and protests. Um, and so that's going to require us, Mr. National Security Advisor, uh, to approach the Congress uh, with an eye towards uh, winning greater latitude to sustain relationships with Thailand, even if the military steps in in a way that um, might trigger U.S. laws. Um, it's going to require us probably to uh, go to our RTA friends um, uh, uh, and, and, and think strategically about uh, how the military positions itself uh, around the succession issue uh, to restore stability so that you can have uh, an orderly process to restore civilian rule if, if the current situation remains at an impasse. Thank you. Can you hear your button? <clears throat> um, I hear a disconnect. I hear you saying, all of you saying, that bloodshed is a real possibility, if not a likelihood, that a faltering Thailand or failing Thailand is a strategic setback for the United States because then ASEAN itself becomes uh, ineffective, vulnerable. Um, but then you're telling me that we should have a low profile approach, we should have a subtle approach. If, if I were hearing this for the first time, I would think, why? Why would we not use all the resources and all the influence we have now to forestall bloodshed, which once it happens is completely unpredictable. We, we don't know how this will end. We know that in other um, societies, Lebanon, which did not have a history, which also had a history, shall we say, of sort of living with civil war and violence, it never really recovered once they got into that spiral in the 1980s. So I would think we'd want to use all of our instruments of power now and be unsubtle to forestall uh, the scenarios you're talking about. Why am I wrong? Or You're right. Or, uh, um, I'm, in a way, you're right. Uh, but the, the question, it's how we use uh, the levers, and we have to be humble. We have to have that, that dose of nuance and humility about how we use our levers. I think we do have, uh, and we should use, every, every, uh, everything in our power to forestall the bloodshed. But it, it may be uh, that, that the United States is not in a position to do that. In fact, I think probably we're not. If the king himself, uh, who is the guardian of the Thai people, cannot or has not been able to intervene and stop this bloodshed, then I, I wonder uh, in, these, in this room whether we, uh, we should uh, be able to convince ourselves that we think we could stop it. However, I think we, we, what we ought to do is find every, um, every, all of our best connections to the Thai military, current and retired military, we should be talking to these guys about how we can be influential with the military to keep the military on the sidelines. We should remember that the Thai military is not a monolithic body. It is now divided into groups, uh, or, or there are groups that guard the prince, there are groups that guard the princess. There are um, divisions uh, that uh, guys like John Cole uh, know much better than, than I do about. We should call him in. Um, John, I'm, I'm looking at you. Um, but I think that um, uh, one, one point here I think is really important, that we, in, the battle, in our efforts to keep Thailand peaceful and protect uh, the peace and keep it strong, uh, we should um, never uh, sacrifice our, uh, our foreign policy principles of human rights, uh, respect for democracy, because in the long run, even if China, which was the first country to recognize the coup in 2006, if you remember, and we took some bruises for that. But I think in the long run, if we stick with those principles, we will find ourselves on the right side of history in Thailand with the Thai people. And I think if we look at what's happening all around Southeast Asia, what we can see is the effective um, harvest of a, of, a, of a last 50 years where the strong men of Asia were very effective in building their countries, moving them forward economically. Um, the middle class is actually now empowered and wants to be empowered, and that's what we're seeing happen in Thailand, just like we saw in Malaysia. Even in, even in Singapore is surprised. The PAP is surprised by election results. But I think in Thailand it'll be a different thing because of the monarchy and because of the unique structure of Thai society. But let's stick with those points, Mike, uh, or Mr. Um, National Security Advisor, and, um, and, and take that path. Let me push you just real quick before I turn to Vikram. So you would agree with, um, with Frank that uh, in the near term we're going to have to bend a bit on principles, and I assume that's with the expectation that the military 
may be implicated in using course of measures that are not going to be popular in Congress, but in the near term that, that we should be prioritizing our ability to engage with the Thai military, even if it means in the near term compromising somewhat on um, these questions of uh, no, I actually don't rights, think. Or do you we think we should have a very strict, consistent? I think we should. Yeah. We should be. Uh, we should have a strong message that we don't want to see the military uh, intervene in a coup. But it it may actually be, and we can imagine this possibility in a very real way, that there are um, there are battles on the streets in Thailand that include elements of the military, maybe not in uniform, um, and the military actually would, if that happens, uh, we shouldn't stop. The, or we shouldn't criticize the Thai military from stopping, uh, staunching that fighting, but ask them to please limit their in involvement to that. Yeah, I, I mean, the key point here is I, I don't expect the military to be the instigator here. I mean, I, I think the violence is going to be organic between political forces, and it's going to be armed groups and thugs and, and irregulars. You know, I, I think that if the military, in fact, instigates the violence, then I think, you know, that's a whole different game with respect to our ability to sustain support for them and relationships with them if we perceive them to be the ones who are setting out to, to instigate? There's, there's, um, let me answer your question in, in, sort of, in sort of two parts. First, on, on what we have to do with the military, it's not really yet about do you compromise or not compromise principles. What it is is about what do you want to see the military completely avoid doing and what do you want to see the military potentially do. Completely avoid doing is get involved in politics and completely avoid doing, and this is where it gets a little trickier, is what, what we need is a, to see is a, is a commitment, and I believe that Thai armed forces have been trying very hard to, to manage this, but there could be a point at which the Thai armed forces have to essentially disarm pieces of themselves. The, those that have decided to choose sides have to be sort of told, you can't choose sides. If you do want to choose sides, you're going to take off your uniform, you're going to hand in your weapons, you're going to get in civilian clothes and go join your buddies, but you're not able to join sides inside the Thai military uniform. The military is going to protect the king, the kingdom, the nation. And then from that stand, from that vantage point, the military should be able to help with law and order um, as necessary. But you said, you said, should we be using all our tools? We should certainly be using all our tools. It's important to focus on the problem here. And the problem is that the political game has lost any of the of the potential bridges any of the potential places for compromise have been lost it's you know it's it makes the gridlock on capitol hill look like you know collaborative unitary government you know this is uh, this is that it is so and so what's happened is neither there have been multiple off ramps from this crisis multiple ways to find accommodations that there have, those those off ramps have been have been rejected, and so the and so one of the one of the questions is is will is it possible for the United States not alone but the United States with Thailand's ASEAN friends with China with other countries that care and have deep relationship with China, with Thailand and the, from the business community is it possible for the political leadership to hear some very clear messages about. Um, hey, you guys have got to find a way that does not take you off the precipice completely to get this, get this, get this back um, to something functional for your country, because otherwise there are going to be consequences, not only in terms of relations, but in terms of your financial situation, your business, your investment climate, all sorts of, all sorts of other things. And I, so I think, that, I think that coordinating with uh, other friends of Thailand to essentially, um, you know, uh, have, a, have, 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 deep engagement with both sides of the Thai political spectrum and try to set some boundaries and give some friendly encouragement towards, uh, towards compromise is, is probably more important than sort of any kind of notion of using traditional tools of U.S. power. So broaden it, get others, get the business community to send this message, but it's still an aspirational message. Are there consequences? Are there consequences that we or other like-minded states describe? I can imagine the business community doing essentially what it did when India and Pakistan were heading towards war in 2002, which was start preparing evacuations, which scared, you know, which made it real that there would be economic consequences. Are there things the business community is or should be doing, for example, to signal, it, no, no kidding, this time this will have a profound effect 
on talent as, as an investment uh, 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 target, I mean, investment environment. Um, are there things on the military side that General Dempsey or General Odianero or others should be saying that in terms of consequences, or do you think that's, that's not subtle, that's not subtle enough, that's not low key enough? Um, do we put consequences on the table, or do we just describe the vision that we think is necessary? I, I think the, the I'll take the business side. Um, I think uh, we can uh, we can um, use the business message. Uh, we got uh, Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker going out to the region to visit four ASEAN countries in June with the I think with the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, at least in two of those countries. Um, I think this message has to be a private one. It cannot be a public message. The last thing we want to do is create some sort of run on Thai business. Uh, but that, pri that message privately should be delivered uh, to the B7, uh, which are the, big, the leaders of the big business associations in Thailand. They're the ones who will understand it most clearly, and they're the ones who can communicate it to the politicians on both sides. I don't think that um, business leaders uh, engaging Thailand's politicians on both sides right now is, it, I don't think they're, they'll be able to do that very well. Um, but I think we should work with our business interlocutors and the Thai ambassador here in Washington to tell them that there is grave concern and it could have uh, consequences on, on U.S. interests, uh, business interests. Um, I think a, a, one, of, one of Thailand's curses is this actual, res, this, is in some ways this resilience, this ability to always muddle through. So in, in a way, um, Thai politicians think they can push the limits, you know, and the country will manage. I mean, I still think you've got something like 3% growth in Thailand just through all of this, right? I mean, after the floods, you had a drop to nothing and a bounce back to 6 or 7%. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense that, you know, it's, you can sort of play with fire because you haven't been badly enough burned. So I don't know that we're able to message that we will do things, but things will happen. And I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how we can best communicate how bad it could get. Um, but I think I think uh, I think it's 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 less a matter of um, us exerting specific lever levers or imposing some sort of, sort of punishments, but just right. a fact of life that right. things will happen both in the bilateral relationship, in the financial relationship, in your status in the region, in your ability to 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 do things. So the out for the business community is to say it's not us, it's the markets, which is true, and the out for. The policymakers is to say, it's not us, it's the Congress, uh, which is an uh, age-old, time-tested way to describe consequences without, from sorrow rather than anger. Um, st still uh, challenging, and there are other cases where we've wanted to forestall this kind of violence, where we've done, I think, of Armitage with Musharraf in 2001, you're either with us or you're with them. But you're not advocating that level of stark um, There's just nowhere drawing. to put your foot. I mean, you can't do that in Thailand because the country is effectively divided. So if you, there's no us and them. It's, you, you have to reach into a broader group who are the Thai people and the Thai institutions, which eventually will need to be strengthened and eventually the people will have their say. You know, that's, that's where this is gonna out, come out and that's where we need to be strong. But we can't afford to be where we are right now, which is seen as sort of sitting back not able to engage because it's too hard. I mean, it's just too divided and we, and I think we're, whether that's fair or not, I think it's actually not fair from what I know of what we're doing. But uh, I think the perception is that while well, Thailand uh, goes through what, what will be in its history, uh, a once in a century historic um, political reordering, that we uh, as treaty allies and Thailand's close friends, you know, those polls, even if I'm right, that it's about Thailand's self-identity, not, not about U.S. policy per se. Even if I'm right about that, uh, I think we need to have been trying to help. And I, and I would, in that area, although I don't think an envoy would be particularly um, influential, I would love to see us get on the phone with somebody like Dick Luger uh, or uh, another uh, statesman who's not seen as a, a, a politicized uh, in the Thai context and maybe think about teaming him up with uh, a friend from Japan, uh, a friend maybe from China, a friend maybe from one of the ASEAN countries, and, and going in just to say that we care and, and meet with both sides, uh, very careful talking points, a limited remit, but it would show that we are at, a high, at the highest level from Washington 
uh, trying to uh, to uh, urge Thailand not to walk it off the off the precipice, as as my colleague has suggested. Um, let me ask about China. Is China going to be helpful, or is this something we should be watching with a wary eye? <clears throat> China's interests are not so divergent from the United States with respect to the current situation in that they, they also want to see stability in Thailand. And, and I agree very much with Vikram that uh, having multiple voices, trying to avoid us-them outcomes in Thailand and to help the Thai construct we outcomes in Thailand uh, is, is essential at this moment. Um, there need to be uh, reassurances given by the region, by the Chinese, by the Americans, by the Japanese, uh, that if the Thai can see their way forward for a we outcome that, that allows for something other than a uh, take no prisoners political uh, bloodletting, um, that that will be supported by the international community. And I never thought I would hear myself saying this, but in much the same way that the international community attempted uh, with I would argue some modest success uh, to mitigate the political tensions in Cambodia uh, between royalists and, and uh, 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 Cambodian People's Party uh, and, and other factions inside Cambodia at a time of, of its uh, early political maturation post-UN intervention. I think that there's a role for the international community to essentially uh, remind the Thai of the things that they share remind the Thai political forces of the opportunities that might exist for win-win outcomes. Um, and to then put some muscle behind that in terms of, of uh, prestige, uh, uh, economic openings, uh, reassurances, confidence building, you know, if the Thai can see their way forward. So, so I, I think the Chinese here um, should not be viewed uh, suspiciously by the United States. I, I think, in fact, there's an opportunity uh, to work uh, with China, uh, which increasingly has enormous economic muscle uh, in the region, largest trading partner of pretty much everyone in the region. Um, and, and they can offer resources. Uh, they can bring to bear resources that, that could be leveraged for political stability. Um, I, I think I agree with Frank. I think that on, on balance, China would, would, would be helpful here. I'm not sure how effectively we've engaged with them on concerns about stability in Thailand, but um, the Chinese want stability, not just in Thailand, but uh, you know, uh, actually uh, internally in all, these, in, in all the Southeast Asian nations, um, even as they're trying to exert pressure and influence and, and uh, win the day on various issues. So I actually think the time to worry about China for us is the day after the crisis. It's not necessarily during the crisis. Um, the, 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 the day after the crisis, there's no doubt that I think China is um, essentially in competition with the United States for influence uh, with, uh, with the Thai people and leadership. Um, I think for the most part, uh, the Thai uh, elites believe they can have have it both ways, and actually I think that's probably true, and I think for most of the region, having it both ways is the right outcome. You want to be in you know, great relations with the United States, great relations with China. Um, Thailand kind of epitomizes where a lot of countries want to be. Its best military relationship is with the United States. It has strong political and other business relationships with the United States, but China is its largest trading partner, and that's the, that sort of seems to be the natural order of things for, for them. But we do have unique ties, security and political ties with Thailand that would potentially be challenged by a deepening partnership between, uh, between Thailand and China, particularly in the, military, in the military arena. And I think that is something that we should be, we should be looking to in the future as, a, as an area where we want to um, essentially be the best partner and be the best partner to such a degree that, um, that, that we remain the partner of choice for Thailand in those, in those areas while welcoming their deep, deepening um, economic and other ties uh, with China and with the rest of ASEAN and quite frankly with Europe and the United States as well. I don't have much to add other than we're on the right track here already. We have um, agreed to and welcome Chinese participation in Cobra Gold. Uh, for the first time, uh, I think last year. And um, um, our overall goal here, let's remind ourselves, is to uh, get the Chinese uh, to 
sit at the table with all of us and help solve problems, make the rules, and then follow those rules with everyone else. So this is actually a good opportunity to bring China in uh, to, the, to uh, a problem that does, I think, affect uh, all of us together. And number two, uh, we should also try to use ASEAN and strengthen ASEAN while we, uh, while we uh, uh, address the Thai problem. So we should, whatever we do, let's remember to consult with our ASEAN colleagues uh, uh, on this. ASEAN made, I thought, a rather bold uh, and, and um, forward-leaning statement out of Myanmar at the ASEAN summit uh, this weekend, uh, naming, you know, the, calling it out directly, naming Thailand and saying that they want to see a peaceful resolution. These are, uh, these are our, our friends, and we want to strengthen ASEAN as we, fix, as we help the Thais uh, avoid uh, the brink. To summarize, um, uh, we, we have a very uh, uh, pronounced national interest in avoiding uh, bloodshed and avoiding uh, more chaos. Um, because Thailand is an old friend, uh, traditionally a hub of our presence in the region, and across the military and DEA and a whole bunch of issues because we care about ASEAN, core of ASEAN, because we care about the democratic example beyond Asia, um, and because if it goes badly, it could turn into a location of intensified competition with China that we don't want. And the toolkit is, uh, you're telling me, engage the military. And as Frank said, we gotta have to be creative, but also ask for congressional support for that. Um, an envoy. Um, Dick Luger has done it before, yeah. um, someone like that. Broaden the friends who are conveying these messages. Uh, you're telling me the broader it is, in a way, the less harsh it has to be. If China, the U.S., and others are carrying a similar message, it'll be more effective. Um, and work ASEAN, uh, both as a um, way to help ameliorate the situation, but also because ASEAN's going to be under stress because of this, and we have broader interests in ASEAN. <clears throat> um, work the business community and be subtle. So that's it, Mr. President. You all get to be the president now. And uh, in the Q&A session, you can either um, challenge or revise or question or add elements. So uh, including the previous panel, feel free. Um, Colonel, you, you've been remobilized. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> feel free to, uh, to uh, weigh in on what you think is right or wrong about the strategy or what you don't understand or what our panel missed. Yeah, over here with the Vietnam helmet. Oh, thank you very much. Andre Sauvageau, uh, I'm a representative for the uh, company in Detroit, Michigan and Vietnam, Interstate Traveler Company. Anyway, wonderful panel. And now, the question I have, uh, actually the one I asked this morning was better answered by this panel, I think, than the one that I put the question to about. But, but anyway, here's my question. The wonderfully nuanced discussion of how we handle this important relationship with Th Thailand my question is, why, in, in, in how we deal with China, which was the subject of my question this morning, why can't we uh, put a little more priority, prioritize, in terms of dealing with China, uh, the Philippines and Vietnam and Indonesia, to name three countries that have had a little more spine vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, without deep prioritizing Thailand. Do all the wonderful things you're talking about with Thailand. There's no reason to change that. Every reason to keep doing it. The business relationships, the commercial, the military, all of it's great. But, but, but your questions that you put to, you know, that you, you told us about, I mean, how many Thais are now leaning, but they believe China, Thailand is, I mean, sorry, China is the, the wave of the future. Well, uh, the other countries don't. And so why not work that's my question about thread the needle. Could we do that? Can you back up the Philippines, and Vietnam, and Indonesia and Malaysia, and then at the same time ask China for help on Thailand? Yes. You can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you absolutely can. And, and I think in this case, you must. And it actually helps you, I think. Because you, um, I, I think at some level, um, part of the problem we have with China right now uh, is that they have interpreted uh, signals or put together a narrative in Beijing that convinces them that they they have no outlet uh, they don't they can't use international law they can't use uh, uh, 
po uh, channels that we all, uh, the community of their neighbors, their nations around them, uh, that, that China somehow believes that it, it can't use those channels to achieve its uh, energy security or uh, national security. And I think, um, I think the greater objective of our, of our strategy in Asia over the next 20 years is to convince China that its security is in all of our interests because a stable and secure China is going to mean a stable and secure Asia, which is going to mean a stable and secure United States. Um, so I would say that we can do both things and we have to thread that needle. Being very strong and decisive and clear uh, that we cannot accept the Chinese aggressiveness uh, on the continental shelf of Vietnam or we cannot accept the way that they have handled uh, the Philippines is not inconsistent with going to Beijing and asking them for partnership and help on preventing Thailand from walking itself off the cliff. To add, that, I mean, it, it, look, the, the, the nature of these relationships is a function of the strategic environment in which all the countries find themselves. So those, those countries that are having real, you know, issues with China, mind you, still with China as their largest trading partner, right? We're not in a binary world where it's if, you know, either or. So right. those countries that are having difficulties with China in some areas, certainly we are, you know, we are uh, the, the country they turn to to say, hey, help us help us argue for, you know, principles and norms of international law here, uh, and, and that this is the way these things should be dealt with. Now, Thailand's not facing those kinds of challenges, and that, that is one of the reasons that we see, um, that you see, that you see, you know, potentially Thai attitudes looking different if they suddenly face some sort of uh, bilateral challenge with, uh, with China, public opinion would swing wildly. Public opinion goes, you know, you know, makes very broad swings very quickly on these sorts of issues. But the, one of the frustrations that I think many have had in the region and in the United States with Thailand is the sense that Thailand isn't living up to its potential, and it's not living up to its potential because of this political uh, chaos and this long standing now we're going on it's what seems like it will be a generational thing of uh, you know that keeps Thailand from actually being what it could be and for our however well Thailand has done Thailand would have done much better if it could find its way uh, you know among the ties towards some towards a political accommodation that works I mean Thailand really would be the center of gravity um, it really would be. Uh, right now, everyone's hedging about, well, how do we do things well, even if Thailand isn't there as a big, as a big powerhouse? And, that's, uh, and that in the mill-to-mill the, the mill -to -mill sphere has been one of the areas that's been a real challenge. We're sort of like, we want, this is an extraordinarily capable military, not only for doing things for Thailand, but for doing things in the region, for partnering, for doing things like they've done recently in terms of like peacekeeping deployments and contributions to counter piracy missions, um, in, you know, in, uh, the Gulf of Aden, uh, those are the kinds of things that they're not going to be able or willing to do if they keep being just obsessed with their own politics um, and, this, and this internal mess. And so that's one of the reasons that I think really everyone in the region can support Thailand sorting itself out. <clears throat> Thanks. I'm Steve Hirsch. I'm a journalist based here in Washington. Um, uh, right at the beginning, Mike, you said something, I, I realize this wasn't the focus of the discussion, but I don't want to skip over it. Despite what Ernie said, you, you, you talked about the unpopularity of the pivot uh, among Thais, uh, second only to the Chinese. And I'm, I'm wondering if you or the panel have some thoughts on why, that, uh, uh, why that's true, what its implications are, and whether that's likely to change uh, when the king dies. Thanks. Well, I, I I want to see more on this polling uh, because I think it's fascinating data, and I uh, I want to learn more about the the sample. Um, I would suspect, um, and it's just a guess, um, that the reservations about the U.S. pivot are connected to uh, a joke I used to hear in Thailand uh, when I first arrived there as a, as a young man. And uh, one of my Thai friends asked me, he says, how come there's never been a coup d'etat in the United States? I said, I don't know. He says, because there's no U.S. embassy there. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I think I think U.S. Uh, U.S. engagement uh, through the pivot engenders a certain amount of skepticism, even among friends, if they believe it's coming with a lot of political baggage and lecturing and admonitions from Washington. And I think 
part of who we are as a nation is that we are evangelical about the mission of spreading democracy and good governance. You know, I think we have to be honest with ourselves about that. And the pivot is not devoid of those values. And so if the pivot were just uh, the U.S. building trade links, uh, I think it would be, you know, universally welcomed uh, throughout East Asia. But, but people understand that there's more to it. There should be more to it. Um, and I think it engenders a certain amount of skepticism uh, among those who fear that uh, it's going to come with meddling in, in internal politics. You know, we did, uh, we did the survey, um, a similar survey in 2009, and uh, we basically asked the CSISs, the think tanks around the region, about 500 people responded. Um, but we got similar answers then from Thailand as well. Now, the one thing I should say, we're going to um, uh, present our findings here on June 5th, so look for that. And um, on the question of how important democracy, rule of law, and human rights are, uh, the Thai respondents were very much with the US, uh, Japan, Indonesia, other democracies. So uh, it wasn't a debate about values, um, but there was a deep, deep skepticism about the United States. And maybe, Frank, maybe that's possible because there's US embassy. I mean, maybe there's a, a closeness allows a certain amount of, of that. It's hard to say. Um, uh, I think I had a question right from the speaker's table, right here. <clears throat> no. Thank you. Titi uh, Nanpong Satirak from Jolalongkorn University. Uh, two, two questions, uh, regional and domestic. First, uh, I can understand from the American policy-making perspective that you would be concerned about what happens in Th Thailand vis-a-vis the China question, whether you know the Chinese would be more supportive, uh, and then if uh, something happens, there's a change of government or something, like in 2006, the Chinese were the first major power to recognize the, the coup government. I think that uh, you don't have to fear as much this time. The Thai crisis is fair. Uh, it uh, dishes out uh, equal flack to the major powers. The Chinese have had some criticisms, criticisms from the protesters, the yellow shirts as well, for, for calling for the election to take place. Uh, so even if you have a, a right-wing government for a while that comes up, uh, the, the, they will remember that the Chinese didn't take their side. And China also has lost some influence and um, lost its dominance uh, in, in Myanmar. Uh, the election results in Cambodia suggest that it's lost some influence. Uh, so I think that that, that configuration to, uh, is less of a concern, should be less of a concern to the uh, for foreign policy making drivers here in Washington. The domestic, uh, you know, if some of the remarks that have been uh, voiced in this room, if the protesters on both sides in Bangkok hear this, you know, they would be aghast uh, that uh, Washington can overestimate its resources and uh, toolkit so much that they can think that they can uh, do this and that in Thailand, uh, you know from uh, here in the Beltway that they can do this in the world. Uh, in fact, it could boomerang. So I think that there's a risk here of trying to do too much. I know that you know, policymakers, you, you sit and you say, okay, what can we do? What should we do? What must we do? Uh, all our resources and, and uh, forces that we can bring to bear, but uh, you have to be careful about the boomerang effect. In fact, uh, Ernie uh, spoke about this. It has to be very nuanced, and it's not, there's no one magic uh, bullet that is going to solve the Thai crisis, not by the Thais, and then certainly not by the foreigners. Uh, so, and Thailand being an independent country, we did, we're lucky in that sense. There's not a lot of uh, foreign meddling. You know, you, you don't have uh, uh, imperialist uh, masters from the past trying to vie for the future of Thailand. Uh, but this also means that the domestic sphere, uh, they have to solve this problem themselves. So I would say that uh, I would uh, uh, reiterate and, and second uh, Ernie's remarks about, you know, you have to stick to principle. So I think that those parameters are very important. No coup, democratic process, constitutional rule, human rights, and so on. And that, that makes a big difference already. And beyond that, in the private sphere, the Thais are not talking enough. So if you want to make a difference, uh, you get the Thais talking in whatever way you can. Uh, and then that, that would be helpful. Uh, and then the, you, know, you have uh, the notion of tough love. So I think once in a while you need to be a, a tough ally. 1997, it boomeranged. A tough ally uh, kind of abandoned uh, the Thailand. But this time, uh, a tough ally could say, look, you know, President Obama goes to Asia, uh, goes right by Thailand, but not to Thailand. 
And uh, the Thais, they take notice from this. Uh, they don't want to be an outcast, they want to be uh, respected and so on. So uh, that's a little bit of a leverage that, hey, Thailand's missing out, it is uh, dysfunctional, malfunctioning, and if it continues to be so, then it'll be shunned and disregarded. And that is a kind of a wake-up call that the Thais, it'll set another parameter for the Thais when they, when they fight. Those are, those are excellent points, and in defense of my, of my panelists, I think they all were clear um, uh, that our leverage is and our influence is limited, and that we have to be very cautious about drawing red lines or threatening consequences. I was pushing them, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I'm satisfied with their answers. <laughs> I think, I think they, uh, they, they address your concerns. But you make an excellent point about dialogue, and no one raised that. Is there a role for the U.S. or the international community to foster dialogue? Can, can you think of specific ways, or do we risk looking too heavy-handed? Dialogue among the parties with Yeah, I, I would just say that um, I was discussing this with outstanding Thai <laughs> experts yesterday, and I slept on it too, and I don't have the answer yet, but I think the answer is we, we need to find a way. Uh, how do you bring uh, two uh, existentially opposed forces within a uh, national context together in some way that doesn't boomerang right in your, or, or blow up in your face, to be honest with you? And uh, I was trying to think about a way to do that, whether you could invite everybody to a football game or something like that. But, uh, I, mean, I mean, soccer, you know, and not, not that kind of football. But um, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. But I think it is a good idea. But we, we need someone smarter than, uh, smarter than I am to, uh, to have an idea about how to do that. Mansfield Center. Yes. Um, yes, ma'am. Can we take a few more? Hi, my name is Meredith Sandler. I uh, appreciate being called on. Also, I've been listening. Thanks, Ernie, for your email early this morning that this was going to be online because I've been listening to it and then finally scurried over here at uh, a little bit late, 1.15 or something like that. So thank you. And thank you to the panel, especially the last intervention. Um, I, for full disclosure, um, I have a small firm, and we are uh, the international trade advisor to the Office of Commercial Affairs at the Royal Thai Embassy. And I also work with the Embassy of Indonesia and really about 25 other embassies here. So I, I want to be clear that I'm probably biased. But in a way, and I was just in Thailand uh, in February and March. And when I was there, I expected, I was scared. Um, in fact, I got my will done. Um, and I hadn't done that before until last time before I went to Algeria. So you can tell the, you know, because I've been listening. But anyway, um, it's not like that. I mean, there were places I couldn't go. It was the first of the popcorn bombs um, that occurred when I was there. But I was amazed both by the continuing work of the Thai government ministry officials, as well as the economic vitality and building and production and union workers and you know of the rest of the country. So the Mr. Uh, National Security Advisor, um, the thing I would ask is the U.S. has, is right now sitting with real decisions. They're small, but they're important. One is uh, the decision on uh, trafficking in persons, whether Thailand will go to Thai, um, uh, Tier 3 versus go up to Thai, uh, Tier 2. Now, I'm not advocating one way or another, but and the reason I was in Thailand was to do a fact-finding trip, which personally, as a typical American, I was like, yeah, how could have anything have, have happened positively? But a lot of people are working very hard, and the government and the private sector are working very hard to deal with a number of issues of importance to the U.S., like trafficking in persons. Um, recently, so I would, I would pay attention to that decision. I'm not saying don't give Thailand a pass like Ukraine was given a pass um, on IPR, but look at the details of what's been done. Not the press, because the Thai, at least in my opinion, aren't big press people. Um, but at the details of that, there's a worker rights petition in the GSP uh, sphere. Look at what the Thais specifically have been doing in that. Make the decision whether or not to accept that as a case under review. Um, in IPR, there was a, a very small thing that happened that they, somebody, um, announced that they were going to do a training session um, on IPR in Thailand. That went a lot, it was a U.S. decision of some, I don't know, USPTO or someone, but it made a big deal. It, it made a big impact. 
that uh, the U.S. government was recognizing that th there are many officials and many companies trying to do it right in the U.S. way, which is not always agreed to by the ties. I mean, but the U.S. has its has its sticks, not too many carrots, but and that's so those nuanced or those just those decisions mean a whole lot. And especially, I'm sorry to say so much, but. Ernie, you know, there's some high percentage of the of Thai in GDP is supported by exports. So, anything that we can do to keep those exports going, as was said, the flood hit it, but in the last eight months, it's not been the case. Thailand is a leader in this uh, uh, effort to get this GSP renewed. Uh, 19 billion dollars of duty-free imports that basically help U.S. companies and also. Uh, suppliers in 123 developing countries. But Thailand is a leader in that. In the midst of everything else, it is it is organized 22 countries to try to go to the Hill and get this get Congress to move it, at least this. And if that can, if the, the administration has not been strong on that, has not really, with all due respect, because I was one of them once, um, you know, so those kinds of things can make a difference. Thank you. Um, thank you. My wife was in Bangkok around the same time as you, and she brought back, uh, she was in Lupia Square, and she brought back, you know, the whistles and the clangers as gifts for my kids, which was a big mistake, because the next morning at 7 a.m., there they were <laughs> in our bedroom, clang, whistle, you know. Um, I'll say something real quick about TIP, and also religious freedom, which is less of an issue for Thailand, but the Trafficking in Persons Office. All too often, the State Department and the NSC regional offices approach the tip office like it's an antibody within the department or within the government to be contained and destroyed. Um, and that never ends well. And we're much more successful, and I know this from experience, when the NSC, I'm not gonna look at anybody in particular, but when the NSC and the East Asia Bureau sit down with the chamber, with the tip office, with NGOs, and start coming up with a plan, because at the end of the day, the way that office works is it wants to see intent, wants to see progress, and you can do that. If you're, that's what diplomacy is all about. So these, to me, are not game stoppers, and shouldn't be problems. These should be areas where this crisis really forces us to think strategically and gets people in senior positions to start pulling together stakeholders to get a win-win solution. I don't think that should be, you, you, you gave a couple of examples, but I don't think any of them should be, let me rephrase that, all of them should be looked at as opportunities, not threats to the U.S.-Thai relationship. Um, but that takes uh, strategic intent and the kind of attitude I think our panel has talked about. I don't know if you want to, okay. Just the only thing I would add is, I, I, look, I, I honestly think that the, the um, our, our ambassador has consistently made sure that I, th I think in this case that we continue to work on all the things we can work on constructively with Thailand. I've actually seen that has been my sense from the folks in the field has been that we're continuing to do just about everything. This gets back to the ability of Thailand to, to what I called muddle through, which is that you actually see a country that can go through a great deal of crisis and continue to be very functional. So I don't, you know, our, our operations in, in Thailand are tremendously broad and deep. We have an awful lot of people working in Thailand every day, and they are all, for the most part, I think, doing their jobs with uh, mostly traffic inconvenience. That's, you know, the largest, uh, that's the largest disruption. But that doesn't mean that this is not a profound crisis that Thailand faces. That means that above that, we've got to, we have to really think about how we help them, how we help Thailand, uh, you know, get to a good place. I'm gonna, uh, with Ernie's forbearance, call on the, uh, the, the Colonel and one other speaker uh, Sunai from the speaker's table, but you both ask your questions and we'll end with that. So uh, I think, Colonel, you're first, and, and then Sunai. <clears throat> Sir, can you hear me? John Cole, retired officer. Uh, I represent myself. I'm uh, opening up a surfing equipment shop on the North Shore in Hawaii and uh, <laughs> haven't, haven't haven't incorporated yet, but uh, just in case, uh, you know, I do come up with a name before this conference ends, uh, we'll put it on email. Um, what I would like to say is just real quick, number one is our mill-to-mill -mill exercise program is much larger and deeper and more ongoing, and all this is in the open press, it's just not covered by the Washington Post and the Bangkok Post that everybody gets all their information from. Uh, Cobra Gold's not the only exercise. Our special ops people love to go down there. 
our air pilots, our air wings up in, in Okinawa, in Korea, in Japan that can't fly because of crowded airspace, they can open it up out of, out of, uh, out of Korat Air Base and these, these Cope Thunder type exercises. What I would like to ask is, PACOM has done an excellent job of, of cleaning up the exercise, particularly Cobra Gold. It's no longer the last cocktail party in Asia. It's, it's a more professional exercise now, as it should be. But the area I think that we need some to increased emphasis is in ASEAN. Going on beneath the, uh, behind the curtain, so to speak, ASEAN defense ministers, ASEAN regional forum, ASEAN are all putting on numerous exercises. They're all involved in HADR, involve a lot of European Union participation, South Korea, and the ASEAN member states. But we sent a group, and many of these people, these young men and women, particularly the Thai civilians from the DDPM, the, the uh, Thai equivalent of FEMA, they've never done an exercise before. And our people were just told to stand in the corner and wait for the little people when they have a question to come over and ask for some expertise. That's where leading from behind doesn't play any role here. Our guys could do an exercise in their sleep. They don't have to take over, they just have to act as a teacher. But for some reason, that's, that's left out. It's a small point, but I think the ASEAN exercise program, building an HADR capacity. Uh, Afghanistan, I learned the big word, capacity building. So um, you have to throw that into every sentence. Capacity building <laughs> is for sure, for sure the way to go, including mil military people, which we do. But it's the idea of we've got the expertise, why not share it? We're not, we don't want to take it over, we just want to show them how to do it. Um, Sunai from Human Rights Watch. Um, the conference now is already in the news of Thai Rat, which is one of the largest newspaper in Thailand. In Thailand, which has already reported that the U.S. call on Thai military not to intervene through military coup, and that, and that, and that, and that. And it's not that because I ran to the back room. No, um, <laughs> and that the to resolve conflict, it ought to be peaceful, democratic, and based on. On, on, on inclusiveness, and this is the, the essence of, of the report already. And, and I think that, you know, given this, the gravity of difficult time in, in Thailand, this is a, a, perhaps the most serious test to the nature of bilaterals between Thailand and the U.S., you know, being very long-term treaty allies and everything. So I think that provides unique opportunity, in fact, you know, to be honest, to be direct, to be candid and consistent. So if it is about principles of democracy, it is about the principle of human rights, and, and have a faith in, in people's decision. It's a message on political matters and security matters. The same consistency needs to be applied on issues on human rights, such as you know, human trafficking, which we don't see any progress, but in fact, the opposite, that you know, the, 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 Thai, the Thai Navy, to name it, that is now suing uh, local journalists suing the Reuters for exposing Navy officer involvement in trafficking. We have seen several cover-ups of, of, of these serious crimes. There's no other reason to say, you know, Thailand should get a pass on tip report, but to ensure that the message from the U.S. has always been consistent on every single matter, and that is about principle. I think this is a major test that we are not looking to just, you know, how the U.S. can support Thailand to get through political crisis, but how the U.S. can also maintain the core value of human rights, including on the, uh, the trafficking of human. Thank you. Excellent points. Let's start with, with Frank, and we'll go down, and then you can give the benediction. Okay. Well, I, I think especially the last speaker and, and putting my uh, former Amnesty International hat on, you know, I will say that it never profits the United States to uh, downplay, disregard, or, or walk away from uh, not U.S. values, but the universal values that are represented by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, by the covenants that the Thai government has uh, sworn to uphold on civil and political rights and uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. And, and I think that the United States uh, needs to stand uh, firmly behind those principles. Um, I wish I could say as a former congressional staffer uh, that the, the TIP report uh, you know, is a non-political document. 
uh, the reality is it's politically tainted, has been since its inception. It's not applied fairly or equally across the board, and the United States makes exceptions for its friends and penalizes its enemies. Um, and that's also part of the reality that we're dealing with. Um, but I'm glad if the message coming out of Washington, at least in some Thai media sources, is a message of uh, hope for peaceful resolution of political differences, military remaining out of politics and safeguarding law and order only to the extent that it's necessary uh, to preserve peace and prevent bloodshed, uh, but not to intervene actively in an attempt to, to choose sides in the political tussle. Um, and ultimately a message of confidence that as the, the, uh, our, our friend who is engaged economically with the Thai people reminded us uh, that this is a country with a lot happening on the positive ledger. Uh, in terms of economic productivity and activity and, and engagement, um, and that we should not um, neglect that even as we focus on the political turmoil. Um, so uh, today's Wednesday, right? Tuesday. Oh, it's Tuesday, rats. That's too bad. That's Wednesday too bad. <laughs> that, that, that's Wednesday in Thailand. Wednesday in Thailand, that's good, thank you. Because my old uh, mentor, Bob Scalapino, used to say that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, he's an optimist, and on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, he's a pessimist, and on Sunday, he rests. Um, so so, so in, in, in Wednesday today in Bangkok, uh, it's a time, hopefully, for some optimism that there can be a peaceful way forward, even if Tuesday here in, in Washington, we are still mired a bit in the pessimistic outlook about limited U.S. leverage uh, and, and uh, limited options for the United States in this uh, polarized political struggle. Um, thanks uh, for both the questions. I, I totally agree with, uh, with Frank on the importance of the United States being consistent. Um, and I would go so far as to say, uh, I think, Sinai, you referenced potential abuses within the Royal Thai Armed Forces, and I would, uh, I would assume, I hope, and I, if it's not the case, it should be the case, that where such uh, uh, events are, are happening, that that's something that the United States takes up with uh, with the Thai military in, in very clear terms and help them understand um, what we see, what's happening and hopefully help them deal with it. I think the, the Thai armed forces, again, have, have proven to be, you know, at what they are, which is a professional military force that is, is capable of, uh, of policing and of, uh, of, of improving um, when it needs to make improvements. And just like any other organization, military or otherwise, that's the essence of remaining uh, good and, and, and strong, is that you continue, that you look, take, you can take a hard look at yourself and do things. So if that's not happening, uh, it's certainly something I, that we should, we should be uh, discussing. The, um, you know, on the, on, the, on the exercises front, I would just, I just say this is a bright spot. This is not something where I would feel at all uh, concerned, and it's certainly not something where I would be at all critical of the way that the Pacific Command has handled um, what we've been doing in terms of the development of multilateral exercises and engagement in the military sphere in Southeast Asia. The ADMM Plus has achieved vastly more than any of us thought it would achieve three years ago, three, four years ago. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I believe the, the U.S. role has been, in many ways, exemplary. We've helped by offering planners, and where the planners are wanted, the planners have gone. Where the planners are not wanted, and the countries are saying, we think we can do this ourselves. We've stayed out of the, we've stayed out of the way. Uh, we've been extraordinarily uh, committed to finding, even as these exercises picked up, and there weren't sort of things that were on the plan, and we were facing difficult choices of how to find assets and stuff. We've tried to make sure the U.S. is there and present and a, and a good participant in these exercises. And these exercises have often uh, have offered some of the unique opportunities that point to where the region could go if things go well. For example, uh, you know, the, the deployment of China's hospital ship, the Peace Ark, in the, in the, in the HADR Mil Med exercise that was hosted by Brunei, um, which was five ASEAN countries together hosting this exercise. When the Chinese deployed the Peace Ark, we were able to put the incoming commander of the Mercy on the Chinese hospital ship every day of that exercise to work together with the Chinese in 
the context of an HADR um, exercise. These are these are these are the these are the winning stories of what's happening in ASEAN. This is the stuff we're trying to make the investments in. This is where we're trying to see ASEAN build its capabilities and other countries around the region um, and beyond, including China and us and India, Japan, Australia, really invest in what will develop into a real. Uh, an architecture that helps provide stability um, for the region. So hopefully we're doing that and we'll continue to do that in a, in a, in a good way. Um, like Frank, I, uh, I fell in love with Southeast Asia uh, in Thailand first. You know, I really, uh, but I did it with intent. I wasn't, uh, I was going to Thailand with a Thai friend and, and he showed me, what I think what he showed me was how important people are. Uh, and you know that's one reason why a kid like me, who's you know from northeastern Pennsylvania, could really relate to Southeast Asia without any prior training and context. Um, and I think that's where we are today. You know, at, at the bottom of the day, I think it's the people that are important. And and I look at this room and I see a lot of faces and a lot of capability. And I noticed that um, although my team told me that there's going to be 190 people today and that. But, but people will come and go, and that some panels will be thin, and and they'll flow in and out. Actually, Elka, you know, no one left. You know, this room is packed, and it was packed all day. And I think that's because people really care about Thailand. And I also think it's because this this discussion was well overdue. Uh, we really need to spend more time on calories uh, in our physically and in our brains on on how to help Thailand. And I think for me, this is just the beginning of an effort. I think we will do more here at CSIS, and we'd like to co uh, cooperate and collaborate with other institutions um, in government and outside of government. And when I'm talking about people, I want to just take one moment to thank someone who helped uh, fund this uh, effort and someone who loved Thailand and really cared about it, and that's Laura Hudson, who uh, worked for Chevron uh, Corporation, uh, and she passed away uh, earlier this week. And uh, she will be sorely missed by all of us. So thanks to Laura. And thanks to Chevron for the support. Also thanks to the Luce Foundation for their support. Um, uh, for me, the, the, at, the, at the base here, uh, I think what we need to do is, uh, uh, and we will write up a report on this uh, conference and, and share recommendations with our colleagues in Thailand and the US government and and, and anywhere, anyone will, will be willing to read it. But I think what we're seeing is that we need to approach Thailand with, with seriousness of intent, with consistency, as Vikram said, with humility, um, but with a, com with a belief that this place will, uh, Thailand will uh, make it through this crisis and that we need to stick to who we are. And, and I think if we do that, uh, I think we'll all be around in a day not too far away where Thailand's numbers, on tour, you know, in terms of how they perceive the United States will be much better than they are in the CSIS study right now. I remember, uh, like it was yesterday, um, after the uh, Asian financial crisis, a couple years after the Asian financial crisis, uh, Prime Minister Chuen was uh, still Prime Minister, and he was coming to uh, the United States, um, and Stu Eisenstadt was then uh, Under Secretary for, uh, I think, Business and Economic Affairs at State, and, and Stu Eisenstadt asked the question, what, what he did is he actually called an interagency meeting of all the government agencies and the business community. I was then president of the US ASEAN Business Council. And he called us all in together and he said, I want every single one of you to tell me every single thing you've done in Thailand. And I want to know uh, what, what, the, what the totals are, what have we invested, how many people are working on it, how many people are involved. And when we put all that together, it was uh, U.S. investment in Thailand was enormous. If you count energy investment, uh, we were by far, and we, I think we still are, the, the, by far the largest investor there. The U.S. government engagement in Thailand was incredible. Uh, the numbers were in the, you know, I think 20 or 30 billion dollars back then. Um, and the ongoing programs, there was a, a list. It looked like literally it was a, it was a almost a book of things that we're doing together. And I think. To be honest, uh, if, we, if we really count up uh, what we're doing, it is. There's a lot. But we don't stay consistently, I think, together focused. And I think Thailand is focused on itself right now. And we have let it drift a little bit. And so we need to pull that back together. So a new paradigm, 
I believe that uh, leadership in the United States on this issue is about building a political foundation for engagement in Thailand and, and, and ASEAN and then Asia in general. So I would love to see leaders who continue to talk to Americans about why Thailand is important to us, to our jobs, to our future, to our safety. Um, and finally, I'd like to end by, by thanking uh, Mike uh, Green, my colleague, for chairing this uh, panel, to Vikram and Frank, to our speakers and experts who came uh, a long way uh, for this discussion. Many of you came from Thailand, uh, from Europe, other places. Um, our team here at CSIS, Murray Hebert really deserves a, a, an enormous amount of credit because he, he stayed up uh, all night, you know, dogging people and, and making sure that they were coming to this conference and, and really used his, the, there's the uh, Hebert soft power is, uh, you know, it can't be refused. So um, please join me in thanking everyone and thank you all for coming.